just for a little bit of something. Just 30 minutes, whatever we're going to do, we're going to think we're going to do it with this thought to put a few more seeds in the mind, program our mind with ideas, with virtue, with wisdom, as tools that we can use to develop our potential so we can help others. Sange charang soke chong nam la, chang cho baru dagni kyab su chi. This is in your prayer books. You haven't got your prayer books yet, have you? No. They didn't come yet? No, Get them now. We'll start again. <laughs> <laughs> then you want to join in, except it's a bit confusing. I always forget the pages. I, every year I promise I'll organ, reorganize the prayers, but we never do. So let me just have a quick look at one. We've only got, how many? Well, I've got 25. Let's hope it's enough. You got yours from last time. I, I'll just borrow one temporarily. You've got two books. And if you really don't want to carry them, you're going to have your PDF then. You're going to get your PDF and you don't want to carry, but they're so sweet and nice. And, there's, and this should be in, the, you should put this in here, people. The front one as well. Maybe best to have both covers. Put both covers in the business, not just the back one. Look, whoever did this didn't do it. She only did it half. I bet it was Christina. Who did it wrong? Probably you, that sounds more like it. Because we were in a hurry. That's no excuse. That's no excuse whatsoever. Now you have to bend it. So ideally you put it in the cover both sides and it sticks, sits in really nicely, the plastic and the words. You don't need the words. Well, I mean, you might. Otherwise you get confused which is your prayer book and which is your... It's very hard putting it in. God, blimey. Doesn't go so well at all. Oh dear. We have to find some way to do it. I can't do it. I'll give up. I'll ruin this person's book, whoever it is. So let me see where this prayer is. Okay, I'm going to get confused, some of these prayers. Various prayers. Prayers before teachings. It could be that, yeah. 69. There's not much logic to it all. I kept meaning every year to do it. Since 2001, I've been trying to make it better, but there you go. 69, there's a few prayers there. Yeah, there you go. Prayers before teaching, 69. So you want to join in. We're going to do different ones throughout the, the time, but this is before we have teachings. We'll do this one and we can do more, but we'll just do the first one. Page 69, that's it. As you'll see, the words say, I go for refuge to the Buddha, Dharma and Sangha. That's the first part, which is taking refuge. And the second part is the motivation. Until I achieve and re reach enlightenment from the merit of listening to these teachings, may I become a Buddha to benefit all. That's the idea. So here's one for people. I don't need it. Who hasn't got one? It's here. It had at least five kilos to your packaging. I'm sorry. <laughs> so the other thing is, oh, we'll do the prayer together. Okay. Ready? 69. If you want to join in. Sange charang soke chog nam la Chang shu badu dagni kyab su chi Dagi chon yen gi pe sonam ki Drola penche sange drupa shog Sange charang soke chog nam la Chang shu badu dagni kyab su chi Dagi chon yen gi pe sonam ki Drola penche sange drupa shog Sange charang soke chog Namla, Jang Shu Badu Dagni Kyab Suchi, Dagi Chunyan Gipe Sonam Ki, Drola Penche, Sange Drupa Shog. Okay, so we've got something from Lamaza Brimshe here, a bunch of blessed pills, and Rimshay's little note says This great long life pill. Hmm. This is not Rimshay, this is Ailsa's uh, uh, writing. Take, great, take, talk, this, this, great long life pill, liberation by tasting. There's a mantra called liberation by seeing. This is a pill called liberation by tasting. Okay? Is made from the Maratika nectar. Maratika is this amazing cave up there somewhere, I haven't been there, about Guru Rinpoche. And Guru Rinpoche is outrageous kind of outrageous dude back in the seventh century, whom all Tibetans adore. If you met, if you met him in a human form, he'd scare the life out of you. He's very wrathful. So it's some place to do with him up there. 
so it's from the nectar from there, whatever that means. It must be something dripping, some holy stuff dripping somewhere. Long life substances and the blessing of the rocky cave of Maratika. So prepared and blessed at the Maratika Chime Takten Churling Monastery during the long life ceremony with many masters. It contains the blessings of immortality. Long life, okay. So we've got a whole bunch. So I don't know how you, I mean, I'm never quite sure how you, I think what you can do is, you can kind of swallow it whole. Well, I think often what you do is you crunch it up and put it in water and you sip it. It's like, you know, you put a little bottle every now and then, you have a little sip every now and again. I think that's the way to do it. I've got a feeling, if you'd like. So, what? Hot water, yeah, so it, it, or you just crush it and mix it up, you know, whatever. So it'd be good to give you a, little, a couple of any, any little baby containers, but we don't have any baby containers. So um, maybe we wait till we get up to louder or something. Maybe we do it, maybe we do it, you might want one on the way up. Maybe you need courage from the yaks or something. I nearly got over, knocked over by a yak last year. <laughs> Craig kindly saved me. <laughs> and then the porter got so, and the, and the yak fellow got so mad at me. It was my mistake, you know. Yeah, I mean, the poor yak, you know. Made him nervous. <laughs> so, anyway, we'll think of what to do. Okay? Yes? Thank you. Good, thank you very much. Okay. So, what should we do? <laughs> you got any questions? Any kind of anything you want to say? Was there anything more you were going to add about karma and continue with that? You mean keep talking more about karma? We will be over the next 14 days, relentlessly <laughs> and loudly and fast, as you must know by now, Donna. Yeah. <laughs> Unless I get sick and I can't talk, you know. But if, as long as my voice keeps going, I'll talk. Maybe you've got to carry me to the gompa for my bung knees. Any questions? about what we heard so far, especially if you've never heard it before. Has nobody ever heard it, never heard it before? Have you all heard something? Huh? All heard something before. But you weren't here, you didn't hear it. Did you? Kath. Where's Kath? Who's not Kath? Your friend, your friend next to you. Where's your friend? Oh, she's still in her room. Okay, good, all right, darling. Anybody else not here? <laughs> not here, Chuck's not here. Okay, I mean, I just thought we would just, I don't know, whatever you want. I mean, I'm happy to rave on, you know, I'm, you can see. Yes, sweetheart. Since I haven't been on a refuge, Say it again. since I haven't been on refuge or retreat before, mm. is there something, um, like, do you talk about intention or magnifying merit while we're on retreat? Wow, it's like, it's like intention, full stop, turn the page, and another part, because the second one, it all came in one sentence. So what do you mean by first intention? Then what do you mean by mar magnifying merit? They're two quite separate things I'm thinking, I'm not sure. Tell me what you mean, what you think you want to know about. I think we should say our names every time so we all get used to each other. Isn't it good? Yes, good. No, we, we won't be like, one, you, oh, there's a wonderful story. There's this one amazing old lama, oh, he's dead now, Chögyam Chögyam Trungpa, you've heard of him? Famous in the 60s. He, he first came out from uh, Tibet in the 60s and he was living in Scotland. He's like, and then he fell in love with this upper class aristocrat, English girl. She was like 16. She, she ran away from home and they fell in love. So they went to get married after being a couple of weeks together. And then at the marriage ceremony, I will take, what's your name, he said? <laughs> they don't care about names. They don't care about names. You know? <laughs> what was your name, he said? <laughs> I find that the marriage celebrant was quite shocked, I think. I mean, he knew her, that's all that mattered. Who cares about a name, you know? Tibetans are like that, but we get very offended if Lama doesn't remember your name, you know? Someone who's known you for 40 years, he can't think of your name, but he knows you. He knows all your past lives and all your future. He just can't think of your name, you know? But we like our names. <laughs> so say our names. Go. Go, sweetheart. Kai. What? Kai. Kai. How do you spell it? K-A-I. Okay, good. Go, Kai. Oh, you need to read this book and you need to do Okay. So just, for me, keep it simple. 
Kai. <laughs> Do you have any expectation of what the word retreat means? Are you expecting something when we hear the word retreat? Because everyone has different definitions. You have no expectations. Okay, that's fine. Well, okay. Yeah, okay. I think the advice Lama Zopa would give us. Okay, no, yeah. Everything I'm saying is coming from Lama Zopa anyway, but in my words, you know, my rude Australian words. He, he speaks politely. So the point is, I think the biggest way to say it for the Buddha, our approach to the Buddha's approach to life, uh, that right now, you know, we're all, if we're, if we're quote unquote in samsara, and what, they, what Buddha means by that is caught up in, you know, fears and dramas and attachment and to whatever degree, you know, completely insane off the wall or mildly like us, you know. I mean, we're sort of fairly normal people. But Buddha says we're still mentally ill. We're all mentally ill as long as we have attachment and fears and drama and depression to whatever degree. His view of, his view of what, we're, what we're capable of, as you can hear from his word Buddha, is kind of radical. So, therefore, one way of saying the whole of Buddhism, what he's trying to do is get us to see everything differently. He says right now we see things mainly through the lenses of I, fears, attachment, anger, depression. They kind of loom to the surface, loom large sometimes when things don't go well. So absolutely for certain, even if you're a seasoned walker, you're going to be feeling really physically kind of overwhelmed. It's a fact, you know. I mean, that's just a fact. Unless you've been walking up mountains for all your life, if, that's exactly, I mean, isn't, that's the every, for sure, every, every, every experience. And, and people get really traumatised sometimes because you just feel you can't cope another minute. And it's not that bad. I mean, it's, you know, we're walking slowly and we're walking over three days and it's only up to four and a half thousand metres. But you really see that. And for me, I swear to you, I think about this trek all year. I can't, I'm dread it. <laughs> I'm not being depressing or anything. I dread it because I realise the depth of my attachment. Forget drugs, forget sex, rock and roll, all the rest. We're attached to comfort. We want our body to feel good. And that's what's going to be tested. So because our body is going to feel stressed, the, our poor mind has a panic attack. And our, the logic of the ordinary world is if your body feels bad, I must feel bad. Do you understand? But so the major, major practice, Buddha's saying, excuse me, it's just your body. And you can still have a happy mind. But you're going to see it is really hard to have a happy mind when, things are, when the body is not so happy, when the body is feeling stressed. So I would say the major one, talk about attitude, you know, the really pure view in the Buddhist one is all, all the bits and pieces of suffering that we have, it's the fruit of negativity. So every time you have it, you're purifying. I remember going to, I did a talk in Miami years ago and the, the topic was why do bad things happen to good people? There was me, a Lutheran, a Catholic and a rabbi, right? Sounds like a joke, doesn't it? <laughs> And so it was easy for me, I went blah, blah about karma. You know, I just gave a talk about karma. Well, what was fascinating, the rabbi clapped. He said, we agree. He was a Kabbalah rabbi. I mean, really traditional Jews don't agree. But he, he, he cracked jokes about Hitler. No, I don't hear Jews crack jokes about Hitler, you know. And he said, we have, they talk about karma and reincarnation. And he said, we have a saying. Every time something bad happens, you go, great. One less debt to repay. So that's an attitude absolutely taking the Buddha's view, that's the essence of the Buddha's approach. Because the Buddha says the external world, including our body, and he says it's external, is not the main source of happiness and is not the main source of suffering. But because we believe it is, it's called attachment, and attachment is a junkie that only wants nice feelings. So just walking up a mountain, you know, stresses us out. You're going to see, I promise. Do you understand? I mean, I'm not clairvoyant because I know myself every year. I think about it all year. And I dread in case my knee goes, because I'm, I'm just not used to walking. I don't, you know, I'm not a country girl. I don't think I've ever walked out in the bush in my whole life. I walk in a city, the length of Manhattan, I'm happy, you know. The length of Kathmandu, I'm fine. But if you give me the bush, I get nervous, you know. I'm, I'm, I'm sort of joking, but I'm not joking. But I'm happy to go, because it's for Lama Zopa, it's for the place, and I know theoretically I want to learn to meditate one day before I die, so I'm creating the cause, hopefully, going up to Lama Zopa's cave, you know. <laughs> So part of me is happy. So the point is this, the real point is this. Because we're addicted to good feelings, this is how we all are, join the universe here. The moment the body doesn't feel good, we make the mistake of assuming my mind has to be unhappy. And that's the miracle. That's the real essence of what Buddha's saying. Just because your body doesn't feel bad, just because things go bad out there, just because Chuck is mean to me, doesn't mean I have to have unhappy thoughts. So that's the practice, is no matter, you know, still recognize your, your leg's broken, 
and, and your, your physical pain, but part of your mind can stay steady and crack jokes about it. That's really when you get a little bit advanced, we learn to be able to do that. But normally we're completely victims of our bodies. We know that. And, we, and, and even the moment there's slightly too much noise, our poor mind stresses out. But the Buddha's view is to see that your mind is one thing and you can learn to reinterpret your experiences. That's the essence of it. That's the essence. So if you remember that, do you understand? And of course, if you want to weep, weep. Don't feel you have to be a martyr or, a, or, you know, or some kind of Spartan. But you know, recognize your knee is hurting, or recognize you can't breathe hardly, whatever, and be reasonable, you know. But p l learn to notice when the mind gets, you know, when the, that the mind then gets aversion, gets angry, gets fearful, gets worried, and that's the reason we suffer, not the physical. And that's something we will learn slowly. So that's the best piece of advice. That's actually putting Buddhism into practice as much as we can. You understand? No, one, recognizing the physical and then listening to the thoughts that arise automatically and then kind of adjusting them, if we can, you know. So then we can learn. So, because to be happy in Buddhism doesn't mean having happy feelings. We think that means happy. That's one example of happy, having happy feelings. But we can have a difficult time, but have a mind that's positive and optimistic. And that's real happiness when the mind is virtuous and optimistic. Do you understand my point? And we have to learn to distinguish them. That's, that's a really, for me, this next four days, the next 10 days is that, the next two weeks will be that. You'll see. So how does that sound? And then we do our best, you know, have a little weep, stamp our feet, get upset with the axe, whatever, walk back home, I'm leaving, you know, whatever. It's okay. You understand. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> so nobody went back last year, did they? The year before, two people went back, didn't they? And one to support the other. So it was just really one who couldn't cope, wasn't it? That's right, exactly, yeah. But last year everybody continued, didn't they? Yeah. But somebody wept a bit and... Because it's just also, it's just intense. It's just intense. And those places up there, you know, I mean, those places where, when you hear, when you talk to people who've meditated, like for some of our friends, Harry and Mary, who are Americans, both got caves up there, beyond where Lama Zopa's place is. And I remember Mary saying, you can't describe the, the pristine, the pristine, if there's a pristineness, I don't know if there's a word, of not just the physical atmosphere, but the, the subtle atmosphere. And of course, when you learn to meditate and your mind gets to a subtler level, you're really in tune with the subtler energies, you know, because they say all the Buddhas and the holy beings live up there, all kind of come wherever there are holy beings, they say. I mean, for example, one of our monks, let's even talk about now about Copan, one of our monks was meditating in our, one of our retreat centers in Spain, a beautiful place up in the mountains. His Holiness named it the Place of Clear Light. Ursel Ling. So our friend Venerable Rene, a Swiss monk, a meditator, who did a two and a half year retreat. And I was interviewing him in Mandela back in the 90s. And he got as far as he could go in his particular, his meditation, which we'll talk about how to get single point of concentration. It's a very specific technique. And he said he knew he couldn't get past a certain stage up there because he said, when your mind gets more subtle, and uh, you, you get incredibly sensitive to the tiniest shift even in the wind, you know. But what was interesting, the real point that I'm telling you, he w I was interviewing him here. Now, it's pretty quiet right now because I'm on holidays. There's no debating. There's not too many bog dogs barking. Normally, it's all barking. There's noises. There's, in the morning and dawn, there's prayers shouting over the speakers. You know, it's really busy. He said his mind got more subtle, more easily here than up in the mountains, because, not the Nepali mountains in Spain, because they say Nepal, Kathmandu Valley is so, all the Tibetans say it's so blessed. You understand? So it's very, that's very interesting. So, so then also try and, you know, it's exhausting up there, but also because it's, I mean, I'm sorry, it's tiring because of the air. And also I think because the place is so pure, they sometimes say it's a bit like, you know, when you're really doing a lot of hard work, you, you, you kind of, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's sort of like purifying. It's like purification. It's like, it's like putting yourself in a washing machine. And one of our monk friends, another monk who's been meditating for years, he said at some point he was out of his brain with extra rage and cr crazy mind, you know, and he's really distressed. And he went to Lama's open room, he laughed and laughed and said, the dirt has to come out, the dirt has to come out. So often people really experience these kinds of things because also of the place being so blessed. And the effort we're making to walk up there, not just to go have sex, drugs, and rock and roll, but the effort we're doing to go and do more retreats. So even that makes it so special and so auspicious and meaningful for us. Does that make sense, people? Does that make sense? So just, and the, so in other words, try and remember to, all the lamas say, that when, we got, when you know the benefits of something, then you're happy to do it, even if it's effort. 
It's really true. I mean, we know that, you know. When you know the, the, the benefit of whatever it is, samsaric or spiritual, samsaric's easier, you know, then you'll, then you'll do it. So when, when we can think of, even intellectually, the benefits of doing something like this, if, if that makes sense to you, that you're working on your mind. I mean, even for me, the fact that on this planet, which is so suffering, that if some of us can come together and even want to do something like this, have fun as well, but to do something that's more than just, as the Tibetans would put it, we're attempting to do more than eat, sleep and go to the toilet. Then we should be delighting, rejoicing in our effort, you know. So try and remember that ourselves and give ourselves encouragement. Because remember the Buddha's point about karma, there's not a millisecond of what we think and therefore do and say that goes astray. Everything programs our mind. It's not wasted, you know. So every thought really does count. And that's one of the things they say when you're really in touch with this whole concept of karma, you watch your mind like a hawk and you want to sow the best seeds for your own benefit, forget for the sake of others. It's a very different kind of approach, you know. So that's what I would like to advise. I'll do my best as well. Not get too anxious about my poor knees. So what else, people? Anything to talk about before we go to bed? Pack your bags. You're all packed? Yes, my dear. Say your name, everybody. Say your name. Bill. Bill. Go, Bill. Um, today I was able to go upstairs and see the remains of the two river shades. Oh, you did? Yeah. Okay. Um, I've read recently in the Mulatto... Uh, Lama book that Lama Yeshi, Yeshi was cremated in Boulder, Colorado. No, no he was cremated in, uh, you know, it's, it's in Boulder Creek, California. Oh, that's right. That's right. California. That's right, exactly. That's right. So where is his remains? His remains are all scattered all over the world in all the Buddhist centers, a bit here and a bit there. People have got them, individual ones. Lama Zopa, when, we, when I was there, we, Lama Zopa gave all the different major, bigger pieces of the relics. They call the relics. I'll talk about this because I'm right now helping somebody edit a book about relics, so I'll talk about relics. But it's, um, he gave us, uh, he bought, he got us to buy little uh, vitamin pill, empty vitamin pill, and put the little ashes in. So he said it's vitamins for the mind. So individuals got these little, you know, pills of blessed ashes. So yeah, they're all over the place. People have got them in there. And they put them in stupas and things, yeah. And actually also Lama Zopa at Laudo, one of the plans, he's got, he's one of got a big plan to build what they call a replica. Of, uh, you know these mandalas, you know, you see these circular pick paintings. Basically, that's an architectural drawing of the abode of a certain Buddha, okay? And so there's one of Guru Rinpoche, this Padmasambhava, you see there's this massive statue of him up there in the Gompa. We had, they had to raise the roof a bit because he's so tall, because right? he had to poke his head up, right? So anyway, Rinpoche wants to build a replica of his pure land up there above his cave. A couple of, I don't know how. So then, um, what happened there? Why was I telling you that? So scattered. What? Oh yeah, that's right. So the other one thing Rinpoche wants to do up there is, is build a stupa, because in, in the earthquake, the Laudo Lama's rema uh, relics and the, and the stupa was busted, so they want to build a new one, and they also want to put Lama Yeshis, there's some more remains of Lama Yeshis up there as well. So we'll talk about all this stuff as we go. Yeah, what else? Yes, Bill. Um, so how did you get, uh, how were you able to cremate them hmm. in uh, Boulder Creek? Oh, because we got a centre there. It was very interesting at the time, he passed away in, I understand, he passed away in 1984, and at the time, he passed away in, in Los Angeles, and for some reason the laws then enabled, allowed us to take his body. So he stayed. In the, he was died in the Cedar Sinai Hospital in Los Angeles. Was there all day meditating, as they say, because his mind stayed in his body for five days. I'll talk about all that later. So then our friend Tom Wa Tom Wagoner, yeah, Tom, in his big, you know, what do you call them in America? I forget. We call them Utes in Australia. Pickup truck, pickup truck, pickup truck. We call them utility vehicles in Australia. Ute for short. U-T-E. You, you drive your ute. You know. Anyway, Tom drove it really slowly up the Pacific coast, up the coast to uh, our centre, out of Santa Cruz in the wood, redwoods. And so then you just we went. They, they apparently called up one funeral fellow. You paid two dollars. He specialised in specialist funerals. And we got permission to take the body and do our own trip. It was very amazing. You can't do that now. No. That's right, exactly. So we, up at Vajrapani, our centre there, 
at the top of the hill. They, we, we, you know, it was over several days, five days, people came from all over the world. And uh, the one old Lama song was told exactly the right architecture to build this particular structure, like a square structure. And then Lama get put, got put into a certain chair with certain clothes. He got tied into the chair. You put him in the thing. Then you chuck wood and oil. And then they build a cone shape, like a, it looks like a stupa, a cone shape, and then whitewash it with a couple of holes in it. And then someone puts fire in and burns the body. Then you do all these prayers and practices for like four hours or something. But yeah, then we're, they allowed us to do it. Now not. No. I know exactly. Two bucks, I think it costs for the special permission. Mm. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Yes. What else, people? Something? Mm -mm. Well, I think we can go to bed then. Or whatever you want to do. Quick meditation. You mean close your eyes and do something? <laughs> <laughs> I understand, Chuck. It's all right. <laughs> uh, <coughs> I mean, it was a it was a I know it was exactly. So, let me have a look in here. Oh, I haven't got it. Give us your prayer book again. Yeah, I'm bothered, Chuck. It's all right. Sorry. Ch Lozang. Children. I always forget your Lozang children. Lundup. Oh, I forget. Sorry, Lundup. Wrong one. I told you the wrong name. Lundup means spontaneous, what's it mean? Spontaneous, spontaneous. And then children, the sound of the Dharma. The spontaneous lamp of the Dharma, she's called. <laughs> okay, let's have a look in here to see if there's something we can do. So this part of this book over here, part one, this is sort of, yeah, this is, the other book is just teachings, lots of teachings. All the stuff we're going to be talking about will be in that other book. But this here is like, Rumi gave this advice over the phone. We first did our first pilgrimage in 2001. So I kind of, so the benefits, how to make the most of pilgrimage, the benefits of circumambulating, the benefits of making prostrations. And then the general, th he told us, this is for, to do with Nepal, not with, to do with going on pilgrimage in India, but it's still in here, never mind. But it's adjustable to us. So I think we can read the Heart Sutra. This is page 40. And we can recite the Heart Sutra, which is auspicious. We li I like to do that sometimes. So we'll do that here, Chuck. So if somebody can lend me a book, I can also do the Heart Sutra. There you go. Yeah, go again. Page 14. Thanks, Sally. So what this is, is Buddha gave it, you know, millions of teachings and then generally known as sutras. He gave, can I borrow one? Oh, don't worry, don't worry. Just give me the book. Don't worry about it. Just give it to me. Um, he gave lots of teachings in different methods, different ways. So this way, apparently, is a particular way that Buddha, and it says it in the thing, he was sitting there in meditation. You okay? You all right? I wasn't sure if you were in prayers or something. Oh, it's in the prayer book, yeah. Page 40. Okay, so it, he, he was sitting there in meditation. Now, if you've ever been to Vulture Peak, I don't know if you've, some of you might have been there, it's very tiny. You squeeze in like 40 people max, otherwise you fall over the mountain, you know? It's very small, with a little kind of fence around. And it's, um, and it's just a very special place, actually. It's utterly gorgeous. But as you say, it says here, the Bhagavan was dwelling on Vulture Peak Mountain together with a great community of monks and a great community of bodhisattvas. Well, I always wondered where they all sat. I mean, it's kind of tiny. So I asked Geshe Dagpa in San Francisco, where they all sat. He said, oh, in the sky. What do you think? You know? <laughs> <laughs> so we can be kind of spaced out now and think we're at Vulture Peak, this gorgeous place. It's a very clear blue sky, way up high, totally silent. Buddha gave many of his teachings there. And he's sitting there in meditation, completely blissing out, right? As it says here. But what happens is Shariputra was there, his big, one of his main disciples. And then as it says, Avalokitesvara, which is the name of a Buddha, but in his in the, in the form of a human being, and they're having a chat. And basically Buddha's channeling his thoughts into their minds and they speak the words, but it's basically called Buddha's teaching. So that's kind of interesting. So we just think we're there, and this is all about the ultimate meaning of reality. Every, all of Buddha's teachings lead us to this one. His, so, of course, we're going to be describing it as we go along. So let's just read it imagining we're there and we're thinking we're doing saying Buddha's words and saying them we're putting this imprint into our mind okay of the meaning of this 
Sutra. Homage to the holy perfection of wisdom. Thus did I hear at one time the Bhagawan was dwelling on mass of vultures mountain in Rajagriya together with a great community of monks and a great community of bodhisattvas. At that time, the Bhagawan was absorbed in the concentration on the categories of phenomena called profound perception. Also at that time, the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, Arya, Avalokitesvara, looked upon the very practice of the profound perfection of wisdom and beheld those five aggregates also as empty of inherent nature. Then through the power of Buddha, the venerable Shariputra said this to the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, Arya, Avalokitesvara, how should any son of the lineage train who wishes to practice the activity of the profound perfection of wisdom? He said that, and the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Arya Avalokitesvara said this to the venerable Sharadvati Putra. Shariputra, any son of the lineage or daughter of the lineage who wishes to practice the activity of the profound perfection of wisdom should look upon it like this, correctly and repeatedly beholding those five aggregates also as empty of inherent nature. Form is empty, emptiness is form. Emptiness is not other than form. Form is also not other than emptiness. In the same way, feeling, discrimination, compositional factors and consciousness are empty. Shariputra, likewise, all phenomena are emptiness without characteristic, unproduced, unceased, stainless, not without stain, not deficient, not fulfilled. Shariputra, therefore, in emptiness, there is no form, no feeling, no discrimination, no compositional factors, no consciousness. No eye, no ear, no nose, no tongue, no body, no mind. The no visual form, no sound, no odor, no taste, no object of touch, and no phenomenon. There is no eye element, and so on, up to and including no mind element and no mental consciousness element. There is no ignorance, no extinction of ignorance, and so on, up to and including no aging and death, and no extinction of aging and death. Similarly, there is no suffering, origination, cessation, and path. There is no exalted wisdom, no attainment, and also no non-attainment. Jariputra, therefore, because there's no attainment, bodhisattvas rely on and dwell in the perfection of wisdom, the mind without obscuration and without fear. Having completely passed beyond error, they reach the end point of nirvana. All the Buddhas who dwell in the three times also manifestly completely awaken to unsurpassable, perfect, complete enlightenment in reliance on the perfection of wisdom. Therefore, the mantra of the perfection of wisdom, the mantra of great knowledge, the unsurpassed mantra, the mantra equal to the unequaled, the mantra that thoroughly pacifies all suffering should be known as truth since it is not false. The mantra of the perfection of wisdom is declared. Tayata om gate gate para gate para sam gate bodhisvaha. Shariputra, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva, should train in the profound perfection of wisdom like that. Then the Bhagavan arose from that concentration and commended the Bodhisattva Mahasattva, Arya Avalokitesvara, saying, Well said, well said, son of the lineage, it is like that. It is like that. One should practice the profound perfection of wisdom just as you have indicated. Even the Tathagatas rejoice. The Bhagawan having thus spoken, the venerable Sharadvati Putra, the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, Arya, Avalokitesvara, those are surrounding in their entirety along with the world of gods, humans, Asuras and Gandavas were overjoyed and highly praised that spoken by the Bhagawan. Okay. So he put some seeds in our mind, which we nourish next time we say it, so that we can realize the ultimate nature of all reality, which is expressed in those words. Okay, so I think we can go to our rooms now, beds, no?